Good afternoon. I'm going to stand up here a minute to get your attention, bring people in. We want to get started. One of the things that we want to talk about this afternoon is the issue of geopolitics and the energy transition. You know, what's the easiest thing to do is to assume that transition has happened and we have a copacetic world <laughs> in which everything works and there is no tension between countries and everybody has their own resources. But the hard part is going from here to there. And that transition process has geopolitical impacts. We've seen in the past year one of the, huge, one of the largest ones that we can imagine, a war in the <coughs> middle of Europe with Russia's invasion of Ukraine that's taught us a lot about the fact that disruption <coughs> happens. But that, let's just say, it's, it's a reality that we have today. And my panel is just saying, we need to talk some more about that. So you know, we can talk more about that. I didn't have too many questions on that. <laughs> But I was thinking about other geopolitical issues as well that we need to get prepared for, that we need to think about. And that's what we want to try to do today is to handle this question of the geopolitics of transition and the kinds of tough questions that can emerge. And I guarantee you we will not answer all of them. We're going to put some of them on the table. But in order to be able to do this, we have a tremendous group of people. Ernie Moniz, former Secretary of Energy, chairman and founder of the Energy Futures Initiative. Ernie, great to have you here. Thanks, Carl. Um, Sadek Wafa. Sadek is the founder of I Squared, uh, uh, an incredible uh, banking background before that, but someone who has not only been an investor in energy, but has been a, a sponsor of think tanks and thinking about the process of energy transition. And Jason Bordoff, the founder and the director of the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, and a colleague in many different uh, um, walks of life, but including one of the top energy advisors for President Barack Obama. So um, Ernie, I'm going to start with you. And one of the things that um, you continue to deal with and you dealt with extensively at your, as your time as a Secretary of Energy was the energy relationship with China. And it is a complicated relationship today. Um, on the one hand, um, we know that the United States and China are the fastest growing, uh, largest economies in the world. They have the largest energy consumption. They are the largest emitters of energy at the same time. And then we can add a whole bunch of other things, particularly related to China, largest investor in renewable energy and the largest investor in coal. Can you? make progress on energy transition and energy security without actually making progress on the U.S.-China relationship? Well, I think the, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I would say the answer is fundamentally yes, one can, except one has to be, uh, one has to qualify that in the following sense. Um, first of all, it's clear that there is no uh, durable, uh, low carbon transition solution, obviously without China, the United States, but also other major uh, emitting uh, parts of the world being part of the solution. So we all have to be part of the solution. Uh, does that involve direct cooperation? Well, that's helpful uh, <laughs> in many regards, but to be honest, um, the China-US relationship I don't think is going to evolve in a, in a dramatic way in terms of let's say, reaching a level of technology sharing, for example, uh, or even a lot of knowledge sharing, uh, there'll be probably more, it'll be probably be more, more competitive. And, and, you know, and that's, that's kind of the way it is. And, and of course, the, the recent legislation in the United States, uh, um, particularly the IRA, but also the infrastructure law, et cetera, uh, I think was <laughs> at least the bipartisan nature of the legislation that passed clearly derived from a perception of competition with China. Uh, that's what drove the bipartisan, right. uh, bipartisanship. But I'm going to take um, a f physicist's uh, optimistic view uh, of the world. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, and of course, Europe has also complained about the IRA, and we, we know all of that. But uh, I'm going to argue that, uh, and maybe this is being overly hopeful, but I'm going to argue that all of this 
is actually the early stages of a necessary discussion to improve supply chain hygiene. Uh, this is not about China or Russia specifically. Uh, in, many, uh, in many areas of great importance to societies, uh, whether it's natural gas in Germany or uh, critical minerals and metals uh, for the uh, clean energy revolution, uh, et cetera, uh, the reality is the principles of resilient supply chains have not been really followed. Uh, and that can be, there can be disruptions from political events, there can be disruptions from <laughs> COVID, there can be disruptions from natural disasters uh, that intersect supply chains. So I think that uh, I would like to look at this as we have a real job to do, all of us, to improve our supply chains, not to have the end of free trade or anything of that type. Uh, and, uh, and that inevitably will come into the US-China relationship because frankly, we have allowed some supply chains uh, to become rather unhealthy. Um, I, I think your point on supply chains is absolutely critical. So I, we want to continue to develop that further. But let me take this issue of the US and China um, and the relationship a little bit further. If, does there need to be at least a bare minimum of common action that shows a seriousness of purpose in order for the rest of the world to actually take the process of transition and emissions reduction seriously? To me? Yeah. Um, well, I think, again, it depends on, com on what you mean by common action. Uh, the reality is that, as I said, the United States and China and the EU, et cetera, uh, need to be taking common action in the sense of, of moving towards a, a low carbon economy. Uh, I think that there is, uh, frankly, overhype on the idea of needing direct collaboration. It's useful. And, and look, John, Secretary Kerry, John Kerry, has done uh, a very good job over many years in trying to forge uh, a closer relationship on China on climate, even as the tensions uh, continue to rise in, in other areas. But I, I am just hard pressed to say that direct collaborative action uh, is a necessary condition uh, for progress. What's necessary is that we all make that progress. And frankly, I believe there will be a common element driving us towards making <coughs> common progress. And it's plain and simple extreme weather. Extreme weather is shifting public opinions everywhere. Uh, and, and I think the question is, when is that going to lead in different parts of the world, the United States, for example, uh, to political action? I believe it will. Um, uh, I just can't tell you what year. <laughs> um, fair enough. Uh, Jason, let me ask you about this then. Um, do you, um, is that credible to you? And from what you hear of the engagement you have at Columbia is, parallel action, as long as it's serious and deep, is that strong enough to make, maintain unity in the international community and to keep developing countries into this game of emissions reduction, um, or do you need something more? Um, thanks for the invitation to be here, uh, Carlos and, and Dan and Sierra Week. And, and yeah, no, I, I agree, maybe not surprisingly, because most of what I know about energy, I feel like I've learned from Secretary Moniz, uh, which is a tiny fraction of what he knows. Uh, I agree with, with what he said. Um, I think uh, you know, the US-China relationship is one of its most strained points in, in many years. The two countries combined are roughly 40% of emissions. I think the answer to your question is you're not going to see sustained global momentum toward decarbonization without sustained meaningful action on the part of both countries. But the question is whether it is whether cooperation is necessary for that. And certainly cooperation is helpful and desirable. We need to think about working together in multilateral institutions, making financing available to the developing world and all the rest. But first, we should acknowledge that's not where we are. Uh, 
the US and Secretary Kerry has talked about whether the tensions with China could be segmented from cooperation with climate. About a year and a half ago, the Chinese foreign minister spoke about how climate could be an oasis in the US-China relationship, and that is not what is happening. <laughs> it is squarely uh, within the tensions within, within the relationship, and there's not too much that both sides of the aisle can agree on in Washington, but being tougher on China is one of them. And as, as, as Secretary Muniz said, that there are some good reasons for that, thinking, about, thinking differently about the rules of free and open trade, about intellectual property, about security of supply chains. And that is something that everyone, I think, in Washington with um, industrial policy is back in vogue. If supply chains are a part of that. Domestic politics and economics uh, are a part of that. Uh, but, but it's forcing a, a complete rethinking of the US-China relationship. So now we're in a mode of not just cooperation, but as much or more so competition. And that can help drive decarbonization as well. If you think about what the most consequential actions to accelerate decarbonization were over the last decade or plus, uh, China's decision, again, motivated by industrial policy to dominate global supply chains for solar and batteries were a major factor in driving costs down 90%. And that is why they're so much more affordable and the outlook for decarbonization looks cheaper today than it did a long time ago. It also means they dominate those supply chains, and that raises a host of other challenges that the U.S. is now trying to unwind. As Ernie said, the Inflation Reduction Act, maybe the most consequential uh, piece of legislation, certainly in the United States, maybe in any other country on climate, uh, and that was motivated by competition and industrial policy and the U.S. desire not just to accelerate climate action, but as, Secretary, as Senator Manchin said, uh, America's economic strength. So I think we are, whether we like it or not, <laughs> in a mode of competition uh, as well as or even more so than cooperation. But that can actually do a lot to accelerate, um, to accelerate climate action. And, and I'll just say one last thing, which is I, I think you know, there was a sense in the past that this broad trend or fear of fragmentation, deglobalization, these, these shifts in the world, um, <clears throat> would make it harder to act on climate because you have to have cooperation. There's a free rider problem. It doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 comes from. What's interesting now is it's actually climate action, like the Inflation Reduction Act, that poses a risk of, ex of, of being a, a headwind on these forces of, of deglobalization and fragmentation, creating trade conflict, if not carefully managed. Sadek, I, I was going to take um, this a completely different route or beforehand until Ernie just disrupted my complete train of thought and put me in another direction. Um, so I was going to ask you, can investment between the United States and China, and, and in fact, there's a huge amount of investment between both countries, obviously a huge amount of trade flow. Is there a route there that somehow can be um, positively linked to the energy and climate agenda? But maybe that's just a misconception. And maybe what we have here are two fundamental rivals that the best thing that can be done on the US part is to play on strengths, use the IRA to accelerate that competition in the United States and push China into a competition because in the end there is a fundamental rivalry for the future. And as someone who has been an investor and a trader in markets, does that make more sense? Is it, what's your reaction? <clears throat> Private investments can certainly help uh, in the dialogue that we'd have with China or any other country. Um, I would say it's, a, in a way, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. But at the end of the day, you have fundamental policy issues that will stand in the way. And unless those are addressed, um, no matter what amount of private investment between the two countries or any two parties is not going to make a fundamental difference. But I think if we take a step back uh, and you hear what has been said and what has been written and the kind of actions that Congress has taken recently uh, in terms of uh, preventing technology exports to China and whatnot, and the tariffs that were imposed by President Trump in 2018, renewed by President Biden, um, again, uh, under his presidency, the fact is there are two uh, clear, distinct roads um, in terms of our relationship with China. Uh, the first is that the conflict with China will lead inevitably to a military conflict, uh, whether it's in five, six, seven, ten years, and on that basis, we should take actions today 
that in fact prepare ourselves, uh, both our, ourselves, our allies, and countries like Taiwan and, uh, and others, prepare ourselves uh, towards that goal. Uh, it's not a goal, but it's a, uh, it's a consequence of China's action from our perspective. Uh, the other one is that, in fact, uh, it is not inevitable, and the panel that you moderated <coughs> yesterday, I think highlights extremely well, and for anyone who did not listen to it, I encourage you to do that, because it was very clear that there was a consensus that, in fact, that first part is not inevitable. Uh, and in fact, we should make every possible effort to avoid uh, getting to that end result. Right. Because in fact, the conflict with China is not inevitable. In that context, I think the approach has to be one where um, we want to compete vigorously with China, uh, but we also want to cooperate whenever possible. I do think when you think about climate change, personally, I think it will be practically impossible to be able to get to net zero without the cooperation of the United States and China, no matter what we do. Simple example, <coughs> China produced or generated half in 2021, half of the global addition to renewables in 2021, just by itself. 50% of the addition in renewable power generation came from China only. But at the same time, China is one of the biggest emitters of CO2. Because its economy is growing at 5, 6, 7%, whatever the number you want to choose, uh, it is also <coughs> building as fast as building clean energy coal plants. So you cannot not have an agreement of sorts with China. And unfortunately, if you believe that we're in the first path, that that conflict is inevitable, there will be no cooperation with China. Today, we are not importing Chinese solar panels. But as you said, they were able in the last 20 years, because of economies of scale, to bring the cost massively down. There's no, there's no particular technology associated with it, uh, nothing that can impact our military or whatnot. And the result is that they were able to do that because they brought the cost down massively. Yet we are not able to benefit from that. So unless we have that cooperation in one form or another, I'm afraid that that net zero is not going to happen. Um, could, could I just comment? Um, Please, sir. Carlos, um, in particular, um, in your question to Jason, you mentioned developing countries. Mm. And, you know, and often these <clears throat> geopolitical discussions end up with kind of discussions about great powers and all of that. But I think that um, the discussion around energy transition and net zero was just mentioned. Uh, net zero is usually associated with 2050. <laughs> um, and what I want to emphasize is this is a pretty silly discussion. Um, uh, the Which one, the ours or the net zero? The, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the the, Both. the net zero 2050 <laughs> discussion, the motivation is, uh, is completely understandable. But what it basically disguises is the reality that we have to have very, very different views as to how decarbonization <coughs> and economic development and energy security are managed in countries at very different stages of development. For example, we keep saying 2050, which I am all for, let's say, for the developed world. <coughs> but you know, China, going back to China, and India, they've explicit, they have made net zero goals, but they're not 2050. And yet we go on blithely discussing it as though everybody is kumbaya uh, in terms of this. And then the, the, the least developed countries who account for virtually no emissions, uh, clearly are on a different pathway where economic development is going to be an essential element in order for them to be able to be part of the partnership <coughs> to, address, uh, to address climate change, uh, for example. So I just think we need to get, the geopolitical discussion has mm -hmm. got to get a lot more differentiated uh, in terms of 
uh, different parts of the world, different levels of development. Uh, and until that happens, I don't think we can have a very intelligent discussion. And, and, I, and in self-defense here, Ernie, um, <laughs> it, it's, um, in terms of trying to have an intelligent discussion, I mean, one of the things that I want us to be able to do is recognize that China's the world's largest emitter. India is on a path of escalation on mm -hmm. use of energy and on emissions. And what happens if there are disruptions in the, in the sense of geopolitics, if those countries don't have the motivation and the incentive to be able to move forward? Put aside net zero, just put it in the context of massive significant emissions reductions. Yeah. Well, first of all, <coughs> you mentioned China and India quite appropriately, and the reasons are obvious. But uh, I would note that uh, we have seen a major disruption uh, in the last year uh, in Europe, and that led exactly to retrograde actions uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of climate. Uh, some positives in terms of a recommitment to the low carbon transition, but in the meantime, clear steps backwards uh, in terms of, in fact, more coal use in Europe and in Japan. Uh, this is not just a question of China. Now, with regard to China and India, again, no doubt that uh, China and India uh, and, again, and others uh, are absolutely essential to meeting any reasonable uh, decarbonization goals on any reasonable time scale. That's clear. Sadek, you did not convince me in terms of the need for explicit cooperation. Uh, the, uh, uh, but we have to, and, and again, I go back to my statement on extreme weather. I think the public's in these countries are actually going to have big sway, uh, uh, irrespective of the form of governance, uh, in terms of the expectations for political action uh, on, on, on low carbon. But clearly, we have to do all that we can, technologically, but also financially, uh, in terms of helping uh, push, pull, uh, whichever combination, uh, China and India, for example, towards that low carbon trajectory. It's absolutely critical. There's no question about that. <clears throat> um, we can stay in this topic for a long time because it is such a big topic. I want to move us on, but I, to me, this is a, a really huge insight of having this discussion back and forth around this issue. And I go back to your point, Sadek, um, from the discussion last night on China and geopolitics. And the option that was put on the table for avoiding a conflict with China was having so much military dominance on the part of the United States and equipping and arming Taiwan that it took off the table the prospect of a Chinese invasion, right? And, and it goes back to this issue of competition. And one of the issues that's coming up here is that perhaps between the United States and China, there is such a significant competition for global leadership that maybe, maybe, this is a hypothesis, and, and I think it's worth thinking about, that the most effective way to engender emissions reductions on the part of the United States and China is for the United States to actually take massive actions to move in that direction on a competitive scale and put China in a, comp in a situation that is competitive, that it wants to continue to compete <coughs> for leadership in a world that is eventually moving to massive emission reductions as well, that they're going to have to do things in a, in a very different way. And that, that is sort of a geopolitical perspective on this that has not been commonplace. And I think it's worth putting on the table and, and thinking about into the future. But I, I want to take us into India because for the very same types of reasons that we were talking about. And, you know, if we think about it, it's 1.4 million, uh, 1.4 billion people, um, one of the largest users of coal in the world, one of the countries that have sought to move to gas, a country that has been, has been disrupted in the use of gas because of the increased yeah. prices. And what does it do with its renewable energy program? Is it big enough and is it fast enough? And so, Jason, I, I want to come back to you um, and, and sort of get your perspective on, um, on the critical importance of India in this transition process. But what do we need to do to be able to support India to actually achieve this massive 
set of goals that has been put in front of it to be able to, uh, avoiding the term net zero, but have a massive reduction in emissions. Yeah, and just one sentence on China, and I'm moving to a different topic, but I just, depends what we mean by cooperation. And the only thing I want to say is that, well, whatever, trade remains essential, right? And so the Inflation Reduction Act will incentivize more domestic manufacturing, but the scale and magnitude of this transition is such that we are not going to have the mi domestic mining, refining, processing of everything we need within these borders. We're going to have to have a lot of trade in clean energy if we want to have a faster transition, and China's going to still be a part of that. Uh, India, and I'd expand it you know, beyond India to probably South Asia more broadly if you see what's happening in Pakistan and Bangladesh and, 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 and similar, similarly placed countries. Um, you know, per capita electricity use in India is a third of the global average. That's in many parts of the world, obviously, where it's much lower than that. Um, incredibly ambitious goals for scaling solar energy, which I think the government can come close, maybe not get all the way there, but they're making a lot of progress, and yet coal use is higher in 2030 than it is today, even if they achieve those incredibly ambitious goals for solar. That's just what it means to take a country that big and grow its economy at a meaningful rate uh, and, and, and increase its, its population. Um, you, you talked about how India has been so hard hit, and I think what Ernie said is incredibly important. We think of energy geopolitics and energy security. We've spent a lot of time over the last uh, over the last year looking at an energy crisis in Europe, and this, but this has been a global energy crisis. And what's happened in Europe has had ripple effects all around the world. Markets work in a very efficient way, and that's been good for the security of Europe. Prices go up, supplies of US LNG go to Europe instead, instead of Asia. Asia finds another source of energy like coal. Coal prices last summer go to record levels, and if you're in emerging market and low-income countries, you struggle to afford any energy at all. And, and we saw rolling, not only was a third of Pakistan underwater in part because uh, of the risks of climate change, but uh, rolling blackouts and scarcity and incredibly high prices such that Pakistan just rolled back its plans to move forward with gas and are quadrupling their coal capacity instead because energy security uh, for many parts of the world may mean moving away from hydrocarbons and less exposure to geopolitical risk from trade in oil and gas and the, the Gulf countries if, if people are concerned about them or, or Russian gas in Europe. Uh, but for many, it's, it's coal. Coal provides energy security for countries as well and, and we're seeing that trend. So we need a lot of capital going into, uh, uh, if you're gonna have growth in clean energy at the scale we need, it's just, it's just finance and, and, and it's huge amounts of capital. In aggregate, something like three to four trillion, just by 2030, half a trillion to a trillion dollars in developing uh, economies alone. Cost of capital is much higher, the risks are much higher. I think that much more needs to be done by wealthier countries and development institutions to de-risk those investments. We just did a piece of work at the Center on Global Energy Policy about how to mitigate uh, currency exchange risk. That's one example of barriers that exist to putting capital uh, to, to work in, uh, in countries like India. So I think that's all really, really important. Um, I, just picking up on that, Sadek, I mean, one of the things that strikes you about India is that everything, the scale's huge, and it reinforces the point that Jason is saying um, on the importance of leveraging capital. And uh, can you just give us a sense of, um, do, we, do we have the strategies in place, or what would you recommend when you look at the need for private investment on this scale? I was going to, to Sadek now. Okay. Um, and, uh, but you can come into investment <laughs> banking too. Um, <laughs> now, and I, I really appreciate, what's your advice on leveraging the scale of private capital that's gonna be necessary to succeed here? Uh, in, in India specifically? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. We've invested over $3 billion of equity, so call it an aggregate, maybe six, $7 billion on enterprise value over the last couple of years, one of the largest investors in India. Uh, the, the challenge with India is simple. Uh, India uh, has tremendous opportunities, and so we've been saying that for the last 30 years, um, which has, and it, the fact is it's true, it has tremendous opportunities. Uh, the problem is that if you take 1990 as a base, uh, India's per capita income was higher than China's by about 16%. Uh, today, um, India's per capita income is about $2,000, China's 12,000 plus. So it's grown by a factor of 35%, 35 times, and it's six times that of India's. So 
to th think about it, between 1990 and 2020, China's per capita income went from 2,000 to 12,000, and India basically didn't move much, right? One had a 35 times increase, six times, whereas before India was 16% higher, today China's six times higher than India. So clearly India has not been able to capitalize on an extraordinary economy, an extraordinary potential. And I can give you all sorts of reasons why that is the case, having invested in multiple sectors, including, by the way, renewables, which is a huge push by Prime Minister Modi. But, sorry, to go back to this issue of cooperation, the cost of panels in India has gone up by 35%. Why? Because they were imported from China. And you're no longer allowed to have Chinese panels. So that is the kind of cooperation I'm referring to. There is no value at the end of the day in the United States producing solar panels in the United States. That concept of import substitution, which has been pushed by emerging markets in the 50s, right, God knows, 50s and 60s, is a defunct policy. It makes no sense. At the end of the day, if you think someone else is producing cheaper pa goods, buy it from there. Unless, unless there is a genuine, a genuine desire or a genuine need to protect national security. So manufacturing chips in the United States, I get that. Manufacturing solar panels, I don't. I don't care what you tell me. So why is India being penalized by 35% in terms of its clean energy because basically they can't buy solar panels? But having said that, I think the biggest challenge in India is bureaucracy. Because you have states and a central government and each one has its own, uh, and the center in that sense is weak, um, bureaucracy will kill you. So I'll give you an example. We are the largest investor in toll roads in India, over 10,000 lane kilometers. We di recently did a transaction. How many signatures do I have to get approval for this transaction to close? 126. And if I miss one, the transaction does not go through. Mm. So since you need 126 individuals to approve, you know that there is one individual who knows mm. that. Okay, I need, need, need I finish? <laughs> so, 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 so the point I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, that ultimately kills the ability for India to attract the kind of big size investments because of that. China, on the other hand, may be slow in giving you, but you don't need 126 signatures. Yeah. So it's very, very easy to get into China. It may be difficult to get out, but that's a different topic. Yeah, I, I, might, I might just add that uh, the 126 is really daunting. In California, you need only 20 different permits <laughs> for a carbon <laughs> capture project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, can I just uh, add a comment, Carlos, as well, that uh, Actually, Sadek, we, I think we've converged actually uh, considerably because <laughs> my comment about, about supply chains, uh, it was clearly, it's not every supply chain uh, that you need to uh, improve the resilience of. It's those that are important, not only for national security, but it could be economic security, uh, et cetera. But those elements that are central to your, uh, to your well-being, uh, you really need to have better hygiene than we, <coughs> we've had. And I think that's really the point in terms of where cooperation uh, becomes an issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Jason, you want to add? Um, well, I was just going to make one comment to sort of put this great conversation in a broader context. A, a year ago, I was privileged to also be on a panel here uh, with Secretary Moniz and, and Carlos and, um, and my intellectual collaborator, Megan O'Sullivan from Harvard. Uh, and what we talked about at the time, and I'm, I want to mention Megan because as an academic it's important to footnote and give, give credit to the people that you collaborate with, uh, and also because today is International Women's Day and it's a good day to celebrate the intellectual contributions of women and achievements in the energy sector, and she's one of the very best, so I'm lucky to work with her. Um, and she's, but she's not here, so I wanted to, if I have anything at all interesting to say, I, it almost certainly comes from collaboration with her. And, and one of the things we talked about on the stage was um, 
the risks that the energy transition itself would be one of the most geopolitically disruptive forces of the 21st century if you fail to synchronize declines in investment and supply with declines in demand we see growing influence for dominant oil producing states like russia for example their geopolitical influence goes up not down feast before famine for petrostates we called it uh, a world that could become greener but less global because action on climate change could exacerbate trade tensions uh, and a growing divergence rather than a convergence between wealthy and poor countries and i think what's happened with russia's invasion of ukraine has sort of brought into stark relief and sharpened many of these things but these are underlying these are not caused by russia's invasion of ukraine we are at risk of a seriously disorderly transition and the things we're talking about here the growing backlash and resentment from emerging and developing economies, growing trade tensions, uh, the growing risks from price volatility and mismanaged transition uh, are going to be one of the, we need new tools, we need new private sector and policy tools to manage energy security for the decades to come. That's sort of the next piece of work Megan and I are doing together because we really don't have it today and it's going to be a very messy de few decades ahead. And, and we need new tools and I would put them in a context that we need to assess those tools in the context of some of these critical big players, right? Because if, we, if the tools won't work there and, and we fail there, then, then the whole piece fails, right? Um, Ernie, I, I want to come back to you on something that, um, and I, I, I wish I had a button to stop that clock. It says we only have four minutes, and <laughs> I feel like, you know, I, you, you guys may be tired of us, but I, I'm really <laughs> enjoying this, and I, I would love to be able to con keep continuing it. But I, I'm, I'm troubled and perplexed in some ways um, about how to respond most effectively to developing countries. And you put on your finger on a, a critical issue is that a, a fundamental issue for developing countries is energy access, um, <coughs> being able to supply energy to their populations. The issue of loss and damage rose to the top of the climate agenda at the last, last COP. And, and certainly in Pakistan, that is not an insignificant issue today. But for many countries, if you went and asked them, is your priority resources for the future or is it resources to compensate for the past, you perhaps might, it's obviously some kind of an emergency an going Amber on alert. in everybody's phone, phones. An Amber, but, Amber alert. Okay. Um, so is, is your priority for um, resources to compensate for the past or resources for energy access in the future? And my guess is that you might have a, a large contingency saying, let's worry about the future. And I guess what I'm, I, the issue I want to bring back here, Ernie, is um, to what extent is this a risk and a problem? Because we're looking at the same pots of money, the same institutions that are trying to be able to deal with these problems. And eventually, if we don't have greater clarity about what we're trying to achieve, are we potentially creating a yet more complicated problem with developing countries than we had before? <laughs> it's a complicated <laughs> issue. Um, uh, certainly, in my view, the, the loss and damage discussion has every potential for derailing, uh, I think, uh, more productive uh, investments. On the other hand, uh, I, I think that one way or another, uh, the, especially the developed world, um, uh, fundamentally has to find a way to honestly invest large amounts of money in the developing world uh, in order to find the best opportunities to lower emissions. But we haven't done a very good job of figuring out the rules of that game uh, now for a long time. And I think that's one reason why the loss and damage discussion has come up. It's because of the failure uh, to do that. I mean, look at, look at things like the integrity of carbon markets. What integrity would that be, uh, for example? Uh, the, um, uh, look, about, look at the questions of, of really clearly defining things like additionality. Uh, when, when one makes an investment of that type as, let's call it an offset. Uh, we just have not really seriously buckled down and decided upon an, an honest and fair set of rules that would allow effective financial transfers 
uh, to, to the developing world. Now, to do that, however, it's true that you also have to address the 126 signatures. Uh, if the projects, they have to be additional, uh, they have, if they're offset issues, they have to be honest, um, and they have to have integrity. Uh, but the projects themselves also have to be, to use the favorite word, bankable. Uh, and, uh, and bankability involves financial criteria, but it involves also political criteria, uh, governance criteria, and, and I think that we just need to, um, just, I'd say that it's, it's not easy, we need to have serious discussions of rules of the road, otherwise we'll just get sidetracked with inventing new games to play uh, to try to get the, uh, the, the, the problem addressed. Uh, I wish we can keep this conversation going. Um, it's been fascinating. Um, to me, really new insights. Um, I have not thought about this perspective that driving competition between China and the United States, maybe at this point in time, might be the best way to get them to uh, reduce emissions. I don't take away from that, Sadek, the possibility, the importance of potential cooperation if you can get the cooperation, but maybe there's a new paradigm shift here. The importance of India and its scale is absolutely key, but in order to operate in that scale, you need some form of commonality and standardization. Otherwise, you just can't leverage private capital. You made that point extraordinarily clear. And we, we simply have not dealt with, as you said, Ernie, the mechanisms, the rules of the road to ensure that there's access to capital in the developing world. And if you can't fix that problem, as somebody said in a session that we were in earlier, if you can't fix the developing world problem of access to energy, we're not gonna fix the sustainability question and the emissions reductions question as well. I, thank you very much. What a great panel. Which was my net zero comment. <laughs> <laughs> We will now take a short break. Please consult the CIRA Week app for upcoming sessions and locations.